Have you ever had someone write you a letter laying out aspects of your character that needed improvement? Most of us would probably say no, but yet in the corporate world, you may have had something similar when you have a, a review come up. And they'll mention the things that you're doing well, and they'll mention the things that you need to improve upon. But even if you've never received such a letter, can you imagine how painful such a letter would be to have all the things that you need to work on laid out for you? We know our own weaknesses, but human nature being what it is, we try to hide or minimize those weaknesses to around us, and quite honestly, many times we even do so to ourselves. We naturally present our best face to those that we interact with, and we're embarrassed when something happens that shows some weakness or shortcoming or lack of understanding before a group. And even if that letter is tempered with positive comments, it can be hard to hear that we have areas, and maybe even serious areas in our lives that need to be improved. So if you can imagine such a letter is written to you, then imagine that letter being made public. Now not only has the writer made known areas of your life that need to be addressed, but he has made that all public knowledge now. We can see this at times when relationships go sour, especially those in the public eye. You know, they can get very ugly in the divorce proceedings perhaps, but maybe even in government situations or in business, someone will get upset. They'll leak internal memos that discuss, you know, the problems of the corporation. And so that public embarrassment or that humiliation can be crushing for many. And one of the reassuring aspects of the Bible is the record of those that have gone before us. That even though we can expect that they've done so much better than us, God has laid out for us in many ways many of their weaknesses as well so that we can see that we're really not that much different in terms of how God is working with us. For instance, we have recorded for us the example of Abraham and the several times that he lied about his wife not being his wife but being his sister. I've often wondered what Sarah thought of that. But he didn't do it to protect her, did he? He did it to protect him. We have the descriptive nature, sorry, the deceptive nature of Jacob in getting the birthright from Esau. God would have worked that out in the right way, but he chose deception along with his mother in helping to have him to get that, and that became a pattern of behavior for a while that he had to overcome. We have David killing men who were loyal to him, committing adultery on a, on a scale that even God was not pleased with, and being disinterested as a husband and a father that created their own problems there. And we have Paul, before he was called, he was known as Saul, and in his eagerness to protect God's truth, if you will, as he understood it, he would imprison or kill heretics in defense of his religion. The examples can go on. We have many other things recorded for us. But I've often wondered, and others have expressed this as well, will there be similar stories written about us or other Christians who have lived and died since the record of the Bible? That's a humbling thing to think about, that we might be written about in a very similar fashion because we probably wouldn't like all of our life to be laid out in that way. But yet, on the other hand, I think in many ways we've already been included in Scripture, maybe in a way that you haven't considered at this point. So today I'm going to begin a series on the letters to the churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And we're going to look at three things concerning those letters, those churches. We're going to look at those churches as historical churches. What was it like in that day? What was that city like? What were they about? Secondly, then, we're going to look at those churches as personalities within church eras, and that can be backed up historically. As we move through time, we can see the characteristics of those churches flow down through the ages. And then lastly, we're going to look at each of those churches as reflections of times, perhaps, within individual Christians that we can reflect different aspects of Ephesus, Smyrna, and so forth. And even within a congregation, we can have different aspects of that playing out. Today, then, we're going to start by looking at Ephesus and Smyrna. In the book of Revelation, if you want to start turning there, um, it, it's, the book of Revelation is probably one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. Even the, the Christian churches that will dive into that book, there's so much speculation, there's so much interpretation, 
they can be all over the map. Many of them think that this is allegory. Some think that it won't even be understood until the return of Christ, and there's just many different positions on that book because it's, it's so full of symbolic imagery, and there's so many frightening events laid out that many people, frankly, don't even want to consider it. But Jesus Christ revealed something to his church through this book. He had the Apostle John record it. And in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, John records these letters, if you will, that Christ wrote to these different churches in the area of the world we now call Turkey. What I find particularly interesting is that it's not chapter 2 and 3 that are written to those seven churches, not just those pages. So let's begin in Revelation 1 verse 4, actually. Revelation 1 verse 4, we read here, John, identifying himself as the one writing, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So John identifies himself as the author, but he also identifies here that he's writing to these churches. This is further reinforced in verse 11 when he records what Christ says. And so as it's written, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, what you see, he's talking to John, what you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he lists them. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now these were not the only churches in this area. There were quite a number of others. But God selected, Christ selected these churches because of certain attributes that he wanted to address that he knew would be consistent in, in his church down through time. The cautions, the encouragements, and so forth. Uh, we know, for example, that there were churches in uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Galatia. Uh, Galatia was actually more at the fringes of the Roman Empire, and at times were in the Parthian Empire. We have Pontius, Cappadocia, many other churches that are listed that are in this area. But then when we move to chapter 2, verse 1, we begin the specifics of these letters that are written. And so it says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Now these letters were addressed to the angels of these individual churches. And this word angel can literally mean a messenger. And in the context is determined whether we're talking about a spirit being or whether we're talking about a physical being. It's not delineated clearly here. We could certainly use it in both applications. But many people think today of Jesus Christ's message to the church of Revelation as simply historical warnings, that in John's time he was addressing certain aspects with these various congregations. But there's a much broader application that we're going to look at in these messages. So, for instance, one thing is what's relevant today to the people of God. I mean, if it was just historical, we could look back and say, well, that was Ephesus, but there wouldn't be any application for us. And we don't find that at any point in what God has recorded in his word. There's always an application for us because it's all timeless. What's interesting, too, and we won't highlight this specifically today, but you can see it as we go through each letter to the church, Christ has an admonition to every one of them. And if I will simply sort of read it out of context here. This is at the end of every section. So 2-7, 2 verse 11, 2 verse 17, 2 verse 29, chapter 3 verse 6, and then in verses 13 and 22 as well. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even each letter, if we're going to look at it in a historical context, was not just written to one each church individually. So Ephesus was not just written to for them, it was also written to the other ones. And so by extension, we could take this and say, well, even all seven of them were written to all other seven churches, or, and even the other churches in the area, and I would make the case even to other churches down through time. But what we're being told is this, even though these letters were written to these specific churches, every member of God's church is to pay attention to what's being said. There's an application for everyone that reads this. And so, in light of that, we need to carefully consider it. So let's examine th this universal spiritual direction given to us. To better understand what Christ is telling us today through these messages, it's, it's helpful to examine some of the history. I said that's one of the things that we will do. Because each of these churches had an interesting history in terms of what shaped that city 
and then even God's people, we're a reflection of the culture around us, aren't we, to a degree? A congregation in Milwaukee is different than a congregation in Oshkosh and different than Cincinnati and other places. So we're going to take a look at those, and we'll start with Ephesus then. So again, chapter 2, verse 1, we read, but again, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this. So what was Ephesus like? Ephesus had an interesting history in the region. It was very old, even by cities of that time. Many historians place its origin back around 1000 BC. Those original settlers, they surmise, were driven out by the Ionian Greek settlers that followed them. Those Greek settlers then picked up the religion of those people in the area, and they began to worship a goddess called Kybel, K-Y-B-L, excuse me, B-E-L-E. And you might recognize this goddess. She's the many-breasted fertility goddess, later identified with Artemis. Artemis is better known as Diana in the Roman pantheon. In her honor, in this goddess's honor, they built this great temple in the very spot, they said, a meteor fell from heaven. What was interesting about this meteor is they claimed it had an image of this goddess on it. So they built the temple around this meteorite. Much later, a more magnificent temple was built honoring Artemis, but it was constructed on the original site. And this edifice became known as the Artemisian. And it was quite the structure, even for the day. It was built of red, white, blue, and yellow marble of the finest quality. Some historians are not sure if it was the marble colored or if they painted the marble. But it was very colorful. But this fertility goddess then in the temple had a multitude of priests and priestesses. Most of them were involved in these fertility practices that were associated with the goddess. So in 356, to move down from in time, then disaster struck when this Artemisian was burned. It was destroyed by fire. And the fire was started by a person who was crazy. They were a lunatic, to use the word. And they burnt the temple trying to make a name for themselves. Uh, we were discussing this on the drive down from Oshkosh. I had never found the name of the guy. <laughs> so he thought he was going to claim some fame. He's been lost to history, I think. But in the aftermath of that disaster, by this point, the Ephesians had such wealth that they decided they would build exactly the same edifice again, build it exactly the same way, and it became known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was so impressive. In fact, it was far times, four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. It was a huge structure. And as such, it was a source of great civic pride, and it became actually a, a center for a lot of economic activity in the area. Um, for instance, in Acts 19, verse 35, to back up just a moment, Paul here talks about her image, because he's in Ephesus writing this. He says, her image which fell from heaven. So he was addressing this false god. But back to the aspect of the economics of the area, one of the chief industries, consequently, was the sale of idols to pilgrim worshipers that came to visit this temple, that came from all parts of the, that part of the world. Um, and as you can imagine, they brought in a lot of money, not only for the places they would stay and the places that they would eat, but they would buy up these idols because these idols were supposed to charm away the evil spirits to perfect protect the devotee from danger. Um, and so it could be an idol of Diana, or it could be a replica of the building itself. But another source of income also was the sale of scrolls. These were known as Ephesian letters. And this is what Paul refers to in Acts 19. But these scrolls would have different things on them. It could be matters of magic, charms, they could have incantations if people were sick or if they were infertile or if they had some other thing they wanted the gods to address. Um, but these were sort of boilerplate. They could buy them as they needed them or wanted them. And so in Acts 19, as I mentioned, Paul mentions that a number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Paul had such an impact on the area, he actually became a thorn in their side. They hated him because he had collapsed the local economy. 
The sales of the idols disappeared. The sales of these scrolls. I want to focus on that here just a moment. We don't understand what a drachma is. When we read that, we say, okay, 50,000 drachmas. What does that mean? Well, in the value of the day, a drachma was roughly a day's wage. Okay, so let's just take simple numbers here. A conservative wage of $10 an hour, right? That's a starting minimum wage job, roughly. 10 hours, 8 hours a day, that's $80 a day. Okay, that's a drachma. So if we take 50,000 drachmas, you multiply 50,000 times 80, and you come up with $4 million. You can imagine why the locals were not happy with him, the ones that were selling the scrolls. $4 million burned up in a matter of a few minutes, and it changed everything. To continue with some of the history, on the death of Alexander then in 323, one of his generals, uh, Lysimachus, took control of Ephesus, and in 286, constructed a new fortified city at the site of what is today known as Ephesus. The city needed to move over time because it was located not only on a river, but it was located next to the sea as the, as the river emptied into the sea. And so the silt that would travel down the river would collect as, it, as the flow slowed towards the end of it. And you would build up these silt deposits, and over time, Ephesus was no longer next to the sea because the shoreline had moved out. And so they moved it, and then later they would start dredging. That's another story. But then this area came under subsequent control of the different powers that came through the area. After this time of Lysimachus, it was ruled by the Seleucids, which was another branch of Alexander's empire, then the king of Pergamum, and then eventually Rome around the 130s BC. And under the Romans, Ephesus thrived. It really took off, reaching the pinnacle of its greatness. The city leaders were able to curry the favor of the emperors by dictating, excuse me, dedicating temples and other monuments to them. Because around this time, the Roman emperors began to think of themselves as gods. And they began to promote that. And those that wanted to curry their favor would validate that. And so these temples dedicated to the Caesars would rise up. And so in 29 BC, there was a temple created in Ephesus as well, not only dedicated to the goddess Roma, named after Rome, or Rome was named after her in part, but also the deified Julius Caesar. And so from then on, it was declared an imperial cult centered in that area and promoted. And so with this favor from Rome, then other things came along. Emperors honored, beautified the city. The first and second centuries, they even paid for this dredging that needed to continue to keep the river and the harbor open. Ephesus became then a governmental center of the region of what's known as Asia at that time. They replaced Pergamum. We'll talk about that much later. The imperial edict would be stamped on the various coins of this area, and one such was the first and all of the greatest, meaning cities. Another one was first and greatest metropolis of Asia. This was how highly they thought of themselves. Ephesus was ranked highly in this time period with Rome and Corinth and Antioch and Alexandria and Egypt, one of the foremost cities of the Roman Empire. It was also distinguished for its theater. It had the largest in the world at that time, capable of seating more than 50,000 people. It was huge. But they also used it not only for theater, but for live fights between animals, and then later even between animals and men. In this beautiful location, together with the fertile soil, the wonderful climate of the region, it made it a very desirable place to live. And so as the population grew, it became even more important because as a harbor city, things would be offloaded and then delivered other places. And so a lot of roads led to Ephesus. You can read about this in many that, things that Paul talks about even in the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 4 and other places. But when Paul showed up, in the 40s or early 50s AD, the city was not only this metropolitan area, but it had a huge Jewish population. And the dysphoria that took place after the Babylonian captivity, not all the Jews, in fact, a very small percentage went back to what we call Israel. Most either settled in the cities they were already in or they dispersed without, or outside the, excuse me, throughout the empires that subsequently followed those time periods. And so by this time, there was a huge Jewish population, and Ephesus itself had a population of around a quarter million people. Not a small city at all. 
But when Paul visited it, he realized, he saw very quickly, that it was rich, it was pampered, and it was pagan to the core. In fact, he had some contention there. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, that a great and effectual opportunity has opened to me, meaning being able to preach in this region, but there are many adversaries. A little bit of an understatement. Not only was he going up against the Romans and their beliefs and their many gods, but he was also going up against the Jews who believed they only knew how to worship the true God. And so then also he ran against the the movers and shakers, I'm trying to think of the right word. He, he made himself unliked by those that he took power and money away from, didn't he? After a short stay there, he left Priscilla and Aquila, maybe Timothy as well. He promised, if it's God's will, to return in Acts 18. He was joined there by uh, an apo- or a disciple of John the Baptist, Apollos, who spoke very boldly, publicly as well, and in the synagogues. And as it says in Acts 18, he vigorously refuted the Jews in a public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And so he went where the people were initially. Later in his third journey, Paul worked there for an extended period of time. And in Acts 20, we have a round figure of three years. So it's probably roughly between 54 and 57 A.D. that he spent his time there. And he grew very close to the members in that congregation. But with all that in mind, let's continue here in Revelation. We read verse 1. Let's continue with the balance of that verse. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered, and you have patience. You have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Those are positive things. We'll come back to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, now he's back to the positive aspects, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's quite a bit there, but before we move forward, what was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Well, the Nicolaitans came from a wrong interpretation regarding the grace of God. They, much like many later, Simon Magus, and as that was perpetuated down through time, and even Martin Luther in the Reformation, they believed that if they sinned, that God needed to give them more grace. So they saw that as a good thing. So the more I sin, the more grace I have. It's rather backwards, isn't it? It's taking advantage of someone's goodwill. They misused this grace to fulfill their sexual desires, much like Balaam taught Israel in the Old Testament. They believed and said that a person is saved by grace and therefore it doesn't matter how you live. We know that's wrong from scripture, so many other places. But let's look at some of the characteristics. We looked at the history, so what can we learn in terms of what they looked like down through time, especially in the first part of the church history? Ephesus as a church existed for only a hundred years or so as an era, I should say. And we'll touch more on that as we go along, but what we find is what Christ said here initially, is that they left their first love. So we can look at that as a positive when they did it right. What was unique about them was their love and their zeal that they had when God opened their mind to his truth. They had excitement and they moved through the Roman Empire spreading the gospel message. Paul was part of that. So were the other apostles as they went out to the lost sheep of Israel. They were on fire, and they weren't going to be stopped. Didn't matter, as even as Paul said up in Acts, that there was this this adversarial approach that he ran into in a number of cases. But nonetheless, Paul, as an example, and the other apostles were no different. They were tireless, weren't they? Sometimes I read Paul's letters, and I realize all that he went through, especially as you read the summaries in the book of Acts, he just never seemed to stop, did he? 
but he was determined he was going to do as much as he could that God placed before him. But even within that time period, heresies were inflicting the church. You can read virtually every book in the New Testament, the Gospels to a lesser degree, but every other book you can read pretty much as an argument against the various heresies that were already infiltrating the church. Some of these things were that circumcision was required for salvation. That was the Jews pressing on the Jewish converts, that you couldn't be in God's kingdom unless you were circumcised. That was addressed in Acts 15. You had aspects of grace versus works. Paul addresses that, doesn't he? Romans and many other cases as well. We have so many other doctrines that are being taught that are pressing that Christ, not in scripture, but some of the things that were being taught was that Christ wasn't real. He was a phantom because this is Gnostic teaching. Something that is pure and holy and just cannot inhabit physical because that's evil and tainted and not pure. And so then Paul had to address that. Some believed that the resurrection hadn't happened or that the resurrection of the saints had already happened. You know, all of these different things that were pressing. Members were misusing spiritual gifts. We read of that in 1 Corinthians. They were misusing God's grace and seeing their mercy as greater than God. In fact, they were tolerating sin. And so all of these things were building, and on top of this then was the fact that by the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem around 70 AD, it's generally accepted that all the apostles except John had been martyred. And so the church is watching all of this. They're part of this. And then they began to be martyred as well. In the early 60s, Nero was Rome, uh, Caesar of Rome, and he took a disliking to God's people as well. Some of that was flamed by other things that were happening within the empire. But Nero took great delight in persecuting the church. Tens of thousands of members were put to death, put in the arenas, and so forth. And so, as you can imagine, members began to fall away. Wolves moved in, took advantage of the sheep. The zeal and excitement began to fall away. The caution God gives to Ephesus is that you have left your first love, verse 4. And it's not uncommon to see people do that even to this day. As we look at this as a church era, you can see how that happened in this history. They didn't become weary, they just left. They were, they were done in some cases. As an era then, those characteristics dominated the church, as I said, until the start around the beginning of the second century, so around the time of the early 100s AD. And that was around the time of the death of the Apostle John, and then transitioning, as God did with the leadership of the next generation. But God wanted Ephesus to remember the calling of salvation he had given to them. He wanted them to not lose the passion and the zeal that they had. He wanted to see their first love in them again. So what are the good traits? What can we apply as we consider not only historically how that church looked, but as they looked as an era in the next number of decades after the crucifixion resurrection of Christ? Well, he highlighted those, didn't he? In verse 2, he talks about many of those those characteristics, if you will, their works, their labor, patience, that they couldn't bear those who were evil. Imagine living in a city that was so hedonistic as Ephesus was, so fixated on things like fertility rights in a false religion, and not being a part of that, how you would stand out in that world. God wants the same from us, that we stand out. I have to wonder as Time marches on, and we get more into the times of the end. I don't know that it's going to be what we preach so much as it's going to be what we live that will stand out. Because actions always speak louder than words, don't they? And we're going to be different than the world. Will we have a zeal through all of that? What, what Christ is telling this church and those who have those attributes down through time is that the church failed to heed its warning. And he didn't want them to do that, that he would remove their lampstand if they left. He would take away his spirit, his lamp, his oil, that he would disown them. So how many people have you known over the years who have reflected the heart of the church of Ephesus? Sometimes we can see that. Someone comes in new, God calls them, they're brand new. They don't have any history with the church. 
and they're on fire. They can't get enough of the booklets and the magazines and the sermons that are recorded, and they're just eating everything up, and they want to tell everybody what they're learning. They're on fire. They're zealous for God's truth. But sometimes we see those people, and then it seems like they flame out. That's the caution, isn't it? When the novelty wears off, do we have the wherewithal, the stamina to stay with it? So let's look at some verses that I'm going to put up there on the slide, beginning with Matthew 25. At the end of the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew, or, uh, yeah, Matthew records a thought here from Christ. So Matthew 25, verse 11. Christ here says, Afterwards, the other virgins came. Now the five had already gone in. They were ready. The bridegroom showed up. They went in to be with him. The door was shut. The other five now show up, and they say, Lord, open to us. They knew where to be, didn't they, as I've said in other messages. They, they knew the general timing. They knew what was expected. They knew the bridegroom was coming. Excuse me. But they weren't ready when the time came. And notice then what he says in verse 12, and it sounds very harsh, but we have to understand what God expects of us. He answered and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Because they had not lived it enough. They had not lived it to the point where he could see in their heart what they would do with eternal life as he gave it to them. That's a strong caution, isn't it? It's not enough just to show up the right place, the right time. It's not enough to understand the doctrines. It's not enough to know that God is calling us now and what his plan of salvation is for mankind. We have to live it. It has to become part of us. The next verse there, 2 Timothy 1. Paul reminds Timothy of this. When Timothy was a young man Paul was mentoring as a pastor. And Timothy was living in that time period as well. How do you address the things of the world? What is the caution that Paul is reminding Timothy here? The caution is the same for any of us. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, he says to Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. To stir it up because it can become something that we assume is always going to be there or we become comfortable with it. We forget to nurture it. You know, a fire has to be tended. You can lay up a great fire. You've got the perfect wood. It's nice and dry. You've got the right kindling and you light it and it takes off and you get all that warmth off it. On a cold day, there's nothing better. <laughs> well, very few things better. <laughs> but what happens if you don't do anything to that fire? It goes out. Eventually, the wood burns up, the coals die down, and it just becomes ash. You have to kindle it up. You have to push the coals together. You have to move the ash out of the way so it doesn't soak up the heat. You have to put more wood on it in the right way. And so he's telling Timothy the same thing. Ephesus needed the same thing. You and I, if we fall into this category today, we need to do the same thing. If we feel ourselves slipping away, we need to stir up what God has put in us. Because no one else can do it for us. God can do it in us as we work with him. But I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. And there are hard times all around us, just like there were for Ephesus, wasn't there? 1 Thessalonians 5, let's look there. Paul makes a similar statement, especially if we're going to follow through on this analogy of fire. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, he simply says here, Do not quench the Spirit. How do you quench a fire? You can do it fast or you can do it slow. One way to quench it is to take away one of the elements needed for the fire. So you have heat, you have fuel, you have oxygen. You take away any one of those, the fire's going to die. That's more the slow way. You starve it. The quick way is to smother it. So you, you throw water on it, you throw a fire retardant on it, you cover it with a blanket. If it's not a big fire, it'll, it'll do the same thing. So we can quench God's spirit the same way. We can do it fast, we can do it slow. I've seen people do it both. They're hot, they're fast, they run out of energy because they're trying to do it on their own, and they quench it and they walk away. I've seen people quench it just from neglect. They're coasting, and maybe they've been coasting for decades, but they're not on fire anymore, and eventually they just don't know why they're there anymore, and they leave. 
These are cautions for us, aren't they? 2 Peter 3, 1 there talks about stirring up. That word's a little different than what Paul used. Peter, in using that expression, that's more of waking someone up, which goes back to Matthew 25, doesn't it? The problem is not going to sleep. The problem is not waking up at the right time. Not being ready when you wake up. And so then let's go to 2 Corinthians 13. We're probably more familiar with this verse because we highlight it typically fairly often in the spring as we approach Passover. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul says, Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are indeed disqualified? Why would we be disqualified? Because Christ is not in us. God won't stay where he's not wanted. We see that in the world around us. That's not a condemnation. It's simply an observation. They have walked away from God's instruction, even the things they know of a physical nature that would bring benefits. Okay, that'll be addressed in the right time. For the here and now, we're talking to us, aren't we? So, are we examining ourselves? It's not a once-a-year process. It should be a daily process. Am I living up to this? Can I do better? What should I refocus on? Where should I be strengthened? How can I have that zeal if I've slipped in it? Here, this word test, in the second sentence, test yourselves. That word test means to prove by examination. All right, we, we do that. We should do that all the time. 2 Corinthians 7, 11 there says something very similar about what zeal you had. Actually, let's just read that. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11, Paul says, For observing this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly matter. Now, in 2 Corinthians, he's following up, obviously, from the letter he wrote. That's 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, he was taking that congregation to task because they were in this Ephesus era. And while they were not Ephesus the city, they were reflecting many of these attitudes. They were coming from a very hedonistic city as well, very prosperous city as well, a city that was very steeped in the Roman culture, and they were misusing their gifts that God had given them. As Ephesus, he gave them gifts to really light them up and to be examples to the world, and instead of using it to serve one another and to serve God, they were using them as wedges to divide each other. My gift's better than your gift. And so he took them to task. They had the young man with the wrong relationship with his mother-in-law, his stepmother. And they thought they were being merciful and they were allowing sin to grow. So Paul was correcting them for those things. And so here in verse 11, he says, you observe that you were sorrowed in a godly manner. It, his correction did what he wanted it to do. He wanted them to stop and think. He didn't want to just yell at them. He wanted to say, look, you need to pay attention where this is headed. And to their credit, they did. And he says, so it's not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, this is verse 10, I'm sorry, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So he wanted a different sorrow, and that's what he sees in verse 11. So he says, what diligence, this is verse 11, what diligence it produced in you, the right sorrow, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement, vehement, uh, vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. My translation has an exclamation point. He's praising them for all of these things because the right thing happened. They returned to their first love. They responded in a proper way. They were back on track and fired up. He says, in all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, the problem is not slipping. The problem is that we don't correct the slippage. Are you and I going to sin? It's pretty much a given. <laughs> the problem is not the problem. The problem is the attitude about the problem. What are we going to do when we acknowledge that sin? Do we just say, oh, well, and try to go on? Or do we say, no, I've got to fix that. I've got to change that. The caution to the church at Ephesus was to keep their faith burning brightly because they weren't. They were letting it burn out. They had become lax. Their fire was very weak. The lesson and caution there for, 
all church members down through time is, is if we reflect that zeal of the Ephesus era, those attitudes, to make sure that we don't grow lax over time. Do we still have that zeal and eagerness of our calling? So let's move next to Smyrna. What's interesting is, um, I forget what slide had it, but I had a map there. And Smyrna and Ephesus are both on the coast. There it is on the slide now. Don't know how well you can read that. But Smyrna is a little further north along the coastline. But they were both harbor cities. The others were not. But all of these cities were connected by the Roman roads. And the Romans did many things well. One was infrastructure. They knew how to build things and build them really well. In fact, in many parts of Europe and former parts of the Roman Empire, those roads still exist. If they haven't been torn up, they're still usable. The way they laid them down, the substrate, the material they used was very good. But they did these roads for one specific reason initially. That was to move their armies around the empire very quickly. Now, those roads became part of their economy over time because you could not only move soldiers quickly, you could move goods, you could move other people, you could even do mail. So you had mail systems that developed. And so they, they sat on these roads. So Smyrna, as the next city, started out being known simply as the city of myrrh. That might sound familiar to you. That was a... Um, thing of value in the ancient world because they would use the dried sap from these little trees as incense. They would also use them in various medicines and other things. But that small tree gave Smyrna its name originally because there were so many of them around that area. So we move in context in Revelation down to Revelation 2 verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, so what was Smyrna like as a city? Well, it didn't have the rich past that Ephesus had. It was founded in the 7th century B.C., so not predating 1,000 B.C., around 600 or so B.C. It was said that the poet, the Greek poet Homer, was born in this city. Don't take that for too much weight because there were so many cities in the region that <laughs> claimed Homer came from their area. But nonetheless, that would have been around 750 or so. The city was sacked and conquered by various kings. One of the first was the Lydian king around 600. Then the Persians came through in the mid-500s. And then later, um, Alexander. But in that in-between period, they pretty much were of no value to anybody. They were not on anybody's radar. Alexander came around in the early 300s. And then after that time, the king of Pergamum came through and conquered the area. We'll come to Pergamum later in the series. And then after the king of Pergamum was conquered, it was Rome that landed in the area. But even before the founding of the Roman Empire, or Smyrna's part in that, they were a faithful ally to Rome. They connected with Rome for some reason. So around 26 AD, the city won out, if you will, sort of a contest over several other cities in the area for the right to build a temple to honor Tiberius. I mentioned earlier the emperor cults that began to spring up. Smyrna capitalized on that. They wanted to build a temple to Tiberius. Tiberius is the image there on the right hand of the slide. Then they did so, and so it became a center of cult worship for him. But the city never wavered in its loyalty to Rome. They always felt connected to that. And because of that loyalty, Rome protected Smyrna and they contributed heavily to its development. Paul came through the area around the early to mid or so 50s AD, 52 to 57, most will say, and so he was bringing the gospel message to these various cities, and Smyrna was one of them. He actually used Ephesus, if you remember that two-year time period, he used Ephesus as a base throughout the region, and he would establish these other congregations. What's interesting in John's record here in Revelation is that Smyrna received unqualified praise. If you remember as we read about Ephesus, Christ said, I have all these things I really like, but here's where you're slipping, but you also have these things that are good. That's qualified praise. You're doing good things, but here's something you need to work on. In Smyrna, you don't have that. It's simply praise. But he did warn of some impending trouble that was coming. By the time John addresses this letter in Revelation to the city, the population was around 100,000, still not a small city. Smyrna was a major commercial center in the area, again, because it was a seaport. 
things would come in off the ocean, be disseminated throughout the land, through the roads and the empire. But it was also known simply because it was a really beautiful area. And the, what would be the word? The Smyrnians? <laughs> they, they did building really well. They had beautiful buildings. And they took advantage of a natural acropolis that was just off the edge of the ocean frontage there called Mount Pagus. Mount Pagus was very impressive because it rose more than 500 feet above the city. And at the top of this acropolis, they built a summit of buildings like a garland that became known as the Crown of Smyrna. And it was evidently very beautiful in the ancient world. What were some of the good traits then? As we look at this in terms of eras and personalities, well, Christ praised them for their works. We'll come to that in a moment. We'll read these. He talks about their tribulation, their poverty. And the poverty he talks about is a poverty in terms of worldly desires. They were even more faithful and zealous to stand fast in the truth of God. And they needed to be, because with John's death around 100 AD, the heretical factions really stepped up their pressure against the church. Passover was under attack. If you read church history, you'll hear of this time of Polycarp, Polycrates, and what's called the quarter decimal controversy. You already had those in the church that were saying, Passover on the 14th of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, we don't keep that. We're going to keep something different. That's too much Judaism. So then you also had aspects of celebrating the resurrection of Christ, and then moving the Sabbath from Sabbath to Sunday for the same reasons that became incorporated into Easter, Sunday worship, many other things. Polycarp, as I mentioned, was a pupil of the Apostle John. Polycarp was probably born around the 30s AD, so he wouldn't have known Christ personally, but he grew up around the apostles, especially John. Some traditions say he died around 155. That puts him way old. Um, I think he was probably around 80 years old when he died, but nonetheless, he, was, uh, he didn't live very long into that second century. The early formation of the Trinity doctrine was already being discussed, as I mentioned, with celebrating the resurrection of Christ rather than his death. The holy days were no longer kept by most Christians. They were already beginning to drift in those things. The Sabbath was observed only by those who clung to what was called Judaism. There was a shift of those coming into the church, especially some of the Gentiles, that didn't want to look Jewish. So they had to distinguish themselves. And so you have writers during this time, names that you may or may not recognize, but Capocrity, Serinthius, Marcion, Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen. If you read Catholic teachings especially, but even Protestant teachings, when they talk about early church fathers, these are the names they mention. They're all heretics. They were all drifting in the understanding already. But this era also faced even more intense persecution than Ephesus did. Because by this time, Emperor Trajan had made it his personal mission to destroy this church. He did not want to infiltrate the, the Roman culture, the Roman gods. He didn't like the contention within the empire that it was creating. And so those that failed to recant, he put to death, and he slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Christians. By the early 300s then, the Catholic Church had split away from the church. This is the time of Constantine, and what was the fledgling Catholic Church surpassed the Church of God in influence because they incorporated themselves into the Roman Empire. So let's read beyond the beginning of verse 8 about Smyrna. Revelation 8, I'm sorry, Revelation 2 verse 8 to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things says the first and last who was dead and came to life. This is Christ speaking to this church directly. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of synagogue of Satan, meaning they pretend to worship God. They say they have the truth, but they don't. Do not fear any of the things which you are about to suffer. This is the caution. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful till death, and I will give you a crown of life. It's interesting he uses that expression there because Smyrna, remember that building on top of the apocalypse? <laughs> yeah, I'll get it right here in a minute. Um, 
the tall part of the ground behind the city. <laughs> um, that was called, again, the crown, wasn't it? The crown of Smyrna. He says, I'll give you a true crown. Acropolis, that's the word. So he says here in verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death, meaning I will give you eternal life. So what's interesting here is this time period saw persecution, well, I won't say more than any other period, but certainly more than Ephesus. This 10 days in verse 10 is an interesting thing because if we put a year to a day principle that is used in other places in Scripture, we find indeed that historically there was a 10-year period where under the emperors uh, Glarus and Diocletian, this persecution reached a level that most found untenable. Those that were not of the truth left and became part of a false church, but there were those that remained faithful. And this is where he's talking about poverty. They didn't have anything, really. They weren't rich like Ephesus, but this church wasn't rich in the same way either, but they, they had their works. They followed God's law. They lived it. They implemented it. They went through tribulation. They endured the blasphemy of those false teachers and knew that they were incorrect. They proved them so. And so what's the application to those members, church members, down through the ages? If we reflect some of these things, well, Christ encouraged this church area to endure to the death if necessary. We might be part of reflecting that again in the near future. Would you be willing to die for your faith? For a long, long time, we haven't had to consider that. The last 150 years or so within the history of the Church of God, we haven't faced that kind of persecution. Could we stand? Could we live hold, uh, lay hold to that, hold on to it? Well, let's look at a few verses. Proverbs 24. Looks like we lost our slides there. Proverbs 24, though, verse 10. We read this, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That seems rather obvious, doesn't it? So what's the takeaway from this? In order not to faint in the day of adversity, don't have small strength. <laughs> the word aver adversity there, or trouble, has the meaning of tightness, which I find very interesting. Tightness is being persecuted. Tightness is being imprisoned. Tightness is being killed for your beliefs. Tightness is not inconvenience. Right now, we're dealing with inconvenience. This is not persecution. Some have tried to make it out to be. It's not. And I pray for them, because when they face tribulation, it's not going to be over a mask. Tightness is not dealing with people who don't like us. Right now, we still have the luxury, if you will, in this country. If we have too hard a way of things, we can simply move, can't we? You can change jobs, you can move where you live, you can do things to address it. There's going to come a time, as Smyrna faced, you can't outrun it. So you have to deal with it. And the time to gain strength is before you need it, not after you need it. That was the caution to the five foolish virgins, wasn't it? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3 next. 1 Corinthians 3 and in verse 14, Paul writes this here. He says, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Earlier, he talks about building on precious things, precious stone, precious metals, and so forth. But then he also talks about things that are not so precious, wood, hay, straw. You build a straw house, it's not going to last as long as a house built out of stone, will it? It'll decay just naturally faster. What work are we building? Will it endure because we build it with good materials? Or will it not endure because we're building it with weak materials? So again, Paul, uh, sorry, Christ encourages the church of Smyrna because of what, they've, what they go through. And they hold on to that. They hold on to the truth that helps them get through that. So then we come to Romans 8. And Paul is asking a question here that he answers. 
what would separate us? And it's a worthwhile question. Because for some people, it doesn't take much. But with other people, we can see there's probably nothing that would shake them because they're so close to God. They're so involved in this way of life, internalizing it so much. And that's what, excuse me, Paul was talking about here. So verse 35, Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So he lists some things. And notice that it goes from easier to harder. We might think tribulation is the hardest, but tribulation is much like persecution, but sword, I mean, we're talking about your life now. Nonetheless, he lists these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness. Nakedness is just being exposed. You're vulnerable. Peril, sword, as it's written, for your sake, we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. And that doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? <laughs> We're, we're here to be sheep killed. No, that's not what that's talking about. Notice, for your sake. What did Christ say to the church of Smyrna? Even if they kill you, I will give you a crown of life. Verse 37, yet in all of these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, and so forth, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors, notice, through him who loved us. Smyrna lived it. That was their strength, to go through persecution. For I'm persuaded that neither death or life or angels or principalities or powers or things present, things to come, heights or depths, or anything created will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church era of, church era of Smyrna faced great persecution, but as I said, they were willing to die for that calling if necessary. Are we a people who would do the same? That can be any time period in history. Any church member down through time, you might find yourself in that position. Because I've seen people who have gone through years of hard trials, and then they've given up. They couldn't persevere. I've seen church members quit their calling because they could no longer withstand the persecution from family members, from employers, from things in the world around them. But I've also seen faithful members withstand withering persecution for decades. It just seems they don't get a break, and yet they just keep trudging on because they have a different vision. I've seen the works of longtime members endure because they had their strength in Christ. Let's look at Colossians 1 here as the last verse, and then I'll begin summarizing. Colossians 1 and verse 24. Paul writes here, he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And you can go back and you can read some of those sufferings. He wasn't boasting, but at times he had to defend his own apostleship. There were those condemning him that he didn't have the authority he said he did. No matter what he went through, they didn't honor what God did through him. They had their own agendas. But he says, I rejoice in those sufferings. How many times was he shipwrecked? How many times was he beaten? How many times was he in jail? How many times did he suffer inconvenience, shipwrecks, and so forth? He says, I'm rejoicing in all of that for you. And fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. I went through those things to be edified, he said. For the sake of his body, which is the church. He said, it wasn't just me. I'm not just going through those things for me. I went through those things for you, for you to be in the body. Can you do that? Maybe you reflect Smyrna because you can endure trials and be an example to someone else. And I have a very touching example of that. This is a deacon that was back in the New England churches. Oh, I don't remember when he died, probably 2003 or so, two, somewhere in there. His name was Harry Aguirre, wonderful man. His career before he came into the church was building highways. <laughs> he probably had a hand in just about every original highway in New England. But in that career, he also smoked like a freight train. And when God called him into the church, shortly after that, he found out he had liver cancer. So he goes and he gets anointed. He's asking God to heal him, to show him mercy, and God does. Liver cancer goes away. 
He was tireless in his service. He was always there. But then a few years before he died, cancer came back. And it slowly consumed him. His strength waned, his weight dropped, but he never, ever missed a service. It didn't matter how awful he felt and whatever he was going through with treatments or just dealing with the cancer in his body, he got to a point where he was so weak they had to carry him up to the church hall we met in because it was on the second floor. There was no elevator, but he was there every week. He couldn't stand to sing, but he was there every week. He would feel awful, but he would be there every week. And when he died, it was literally standing room only. The, the funeral home was packed to the walls because everybody that ever knew him, no matter where they were at this point, in church, not in church, whatever group they were a part of, they all came to pay respects to him. There was somebody that asked him shortly before he died if he was upset that God had healed him and then the cancer had come back. And he said he was confused at the question. He, he didn't understand the question. He says, no, why would I be? He said, God gave me 15 years I would have not had. He made use of the 15 years. And after he died, then I had a conversation with a couple of members that said, why did God let Harry die? Why didn't he heal him again? And I said, well, what if it didn't matter? What if he knew where Harry stood? He knew exactly where Harry was. And he allowed Harry to go through that for Harry to be an example to other people, to potentially be that example in the future. This is the Church of Smyrna. Maybe we can be somebody like that. Reflect Smyrna, because Smyrna is called the faithful. The word faithful in Scripture means or has the additional meaning of being trustworthy. I don't know if we think of that very often, but God has entrusted us with his truth and with his spirit. What are we going to do with that? Are we faithful no matter what? These churches of Revelation are more than interesting history. They're reminders to us to pay attention to those attributes that could lead us away. We could be in Ephesus. We could be sleep, slip, slipping, sorry. We could be Smyrna. We could have those attributes. We'll see these others as we go through them in the future. But they're all reminders that we can be full of zeal and commitment. The world around us doesn't have to shape what our calling looks like. These letters are all letters from a loving and a caring Savior. And he promises every one of them to be in his kingdom if they follow through. May we pay attention and learn from all of them.